Hey, you guys, this is Josh with Homesteading Family, and welcome to this week's episode of the Pantry Chat Food for Thought. Hey, I've got a really neat guest on with us today, uh, Will Dobkins from Homestead Iron. He makes some fantastic uh, homestead and gardening tools. Will, how you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great, Josh. Thank you for having us on today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you guys, you've seen me talk about some of Homestead Irons tools, and uh, we wanted to bring Will on so you could learn a little bit more about them and why they're so special and, and valuable, and a little bit about his story as well. Um, but as you know, we usually like to dive in and have a little chit chat and uh, you know just talk about what's going on on the farm. And so, Will, I, I just want to ask you, like, I know you're making tools every day, and and out there in the blacksmith shop but you know what's what's going on for you on your homestead um do i have it right you're in missouri do i remember that right that's that's correct jamie and i are in southern missouri um and it is springtime here and we are very busy it is definitely garden tool season so i'm in the shop um turning out tools as fast as i can but aside from that uh, uh the grass is growing faster than we can keep up with it. We're trying to get gardens in, planting seeds uh, every chance we get, uh, fixing fence. And uh, aside from that, I mean, there's a lot of homesteader type tasks we're doing, but uh, it's also, it's morel mushroom season. Um, they're oh, delicacies yeah. that we only get for a little short window. Uh, we spend a lot of spare time looking for those. And the white bass are just starting to run. The water temperatures finally come up just enough that that is on and and that's uh it's not all work we we get our play in but if we can forage for those mushrooms and we can put 10 or 15 pounds of fish in the freezer every time we go to the lake that that counts as as work and and uh, homestead chores too oh man i love it i love it when we can uh, combine some productivity with something that we're having fun at and having a good time. I mean, it's fun to get out there and we're, we're a little behind you up here in North Idaho. So the morels aren't, aren't quite popping up yet. And, um, but that's just fun to get out there and look for those things and be in the woods. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's my kind of work. I like it. Cool. Well, what kind of um, you, you talked about the garden and you talked about mending fences. You guys have animals there on your property. And uh, we're, we're working with that goal in mind. Um, we've had a few animals over the years here and there. I, I, I grew up with a background in large animal hus husbandry. And the one thing I did learn from my previous experience with animals is we're trying to set ourselves up in such a way that we're not completely married to them 24 um, seven. Mm. Like, like I mentioned, we, we would love to be able to pick a fine day when we're not too busy and take off and spend a couple days kayaking on the river. Um, and so that's the goal we're working on as far as fence and, and animals is now is having ourselves situated. So we've got good tight fence. We're not worried about them. Uh, their water situation is good and it's real easy for a neighbor to come by and pop in and a, a scoop of this in that bucket and a scoop of that in that bucket. And they got water and, and we're free and clear to go, chase fish or do whatever other fun stuff off the property we want to do. Well, well, you're, you're doing it right, you know, and that is getting your infrastructure and your systems in place before you get the animals. And that's something that we share with people a lot. And it's not something we've always done well. And a lot of us as homesteaders get going and we go and get the animals and get a lot of stuff going before we're really ready for them. And I'm actually reading through Joel Salatin's Polyface Micro right now. And, and uh, he, he talks about that and some good reminders to, you know, if things are going to be work are going to work well for you and you're going to do this. You need to get your systems into place. And of course, fences is key, um, you know, to getting those up and running before you get those animals in there. So that's that's good. That is really, really good. And, uh, and then, then once they come in, you know, you're you're rolling and you got a good system in place and you're not chasing animals all over the woods or through the neighbor's property. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool, man. Yeah, I, Sounds I've like done plenty. Of that. Yeah, yeah. That that uh, you know that that uh, that kills a lot of time, and and uh, sometimes now we're then fixing somebody else's fences, and <laughs> who knows what else. So. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds good. That sounds like like uh, good work there. Good spring homesteading work, 
And um, let's jump in for a second. We've got a question here, and it's kind of a funny one. I don't know if either of us will be able to answer it, but um, this is what they gave me. And it's a fun, fun discussion anyway. So this question is from Jerry Russell um, uh, from a while back here. And it says, would an ox be less costly than a horse? And uh, I think we were talking about working animals on the farm. And, um, you know, honestly, I, I can't answer that. There are just not a lot of people working with ox these days. And I, I know ox have uh, a certain value and can be a lot calmer than a horse and a lot more steady and, and can even pull them more. I mean, depends on what kind of horse you're talking about. Um, but I would have no idea on a cost analysis. Have you anybody in your area work with oxes or have you ever been exposed to that? Not that I'm aware of. I, I, I can, uh, uh, you know, I'd agree with you on all those those above points. Um, and I would definitely agree that if you're talking about horses, cost is a factor. Um, yep. I grew up horseback and um, they're, they're, they're expensive almost to a point of, I, I think you could really debate uh, depending on animal power on the, on the homestead versus, versus petroleum or, or other alternatives. I don't know how much cheaper it actually is in the long run. Horses can get pretty expensive expensive oxen i don't know i suspect if you're working them uh just like a horse they're going to need to be shod and i don't know where you're going to get an oxen shod these days i think that'd be a pretty specialized <laughs> bit of work i it sounds like it yeah and you know and i think i think that the value we can pull out of that question as far as what's more costly one or the other and it's exactly what you mentioned is what what work are you doing with them? And like you, I, I spent a lot of my youth. Matter of fact, Carolyn and I, you know, originally dated and hung out riding horseback, you know, uh, moving cattle and, and out in the woods and everything. And so I know horses pretty well. And and we've had them some years. We don't have any right now just for that reason, because they're expensive and they you know, what are they going to do for you on the homestead? Um, you know, we may be getting one and I'm trying to answer that question because I've got some kids that really, really want a horse. And I've always said, well, they've got to be mm -hmm. producing something. They can't just be out in pasture yeah. and getting rid ridden a couple times a week that we can't justify that cost. Um, so whether it's an ox and a horse, it's like, what work is it going to do for you? You know, you've got all the inputs to mm -hmm. those animals, but what are they accomplishing? Because if you're just using them once in a while, either of them are going to be expensive and and are you know going to be something you got to take care of and you got to feed and so um i think you got to go into it really thinking about well, how do they fit into your farm your homestead what are you going to do with them and certainly there's places for pleasure and and uh, having an animal that that fits the bill and if that's your recreation we're all spend some money on that so great but you got to just think about that cost analysis in my opinion whatever you do and make sure that the benefit the return on you know that investment, so to speak, is is uh, worth it. Yeah, I, I recall a, a book I read, um, I think like many of us heading towards a homesteading lifestyle, I read every book out there, anything even remotely close to the topic, um, I devoured it. Uh, and one of my, there, there's about 57 books titled The Good Life in the homesteading genre, I think, maybe more. Uh, but one of those was, a guy had lived with uh, the Amish and had done a college thesis on life with the Amish. And one of the one of the little bits in there that I took away from it was he had a bit of an argument with them about the horses. One of their biggest uh, outlays of labor every year was harvesting grain, uh, and the grain was for the horses, and they had to have the horses to harvest the grain. So he posed the question of, well why don't you just get rid of the horses? You wipe out all that labor of harvesting the grain that you have to have to feed the horses. And, and I think some of the elders got together and they powwowed and they came back to him. And finally they said, we don't, we, we like our horses and we want you to stop asking questions about our horses. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they, they really liked their horses and that, that evened it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that worked for them. There, there is, there's definitely a place for that. And so again, it comes down to whatever animal it is, really whatever tool it is, whatever machine it is, because now we're using machines mostly. And I, I do like the idea of having 
some animal backup, you know, and people think, well, but, you know, it's good to have a backup. So I don't, you know, the fuel's getting expensive or what if it gets hard to get? And those are realistic discussions, but you still got to feed that animal. You've got to maintain it. And so if you're, we're having problems mm-hmm. with machinery, you're going to have problems with hay getting hay because you're not the only one having that problem so really you know it's it's a mentality of just think it through you know and how does it work for you and how are you going to survive different situations and what's the benefit it brings to your homestead whether that's work or pleasure and is that is the cost justifiable whether it's an ox a horse again or or a tractor or whatever um, that's the question I think we got to ask ourselves Mm -hmm. and um, so good thought Jerry Jerry Russell there thanks for asking that question and um, if you do get an ox and put it to work, we'd love to see some some pictures. And because uh, okay. I, I do, I've had an interest. I've always thought that would be cool to have a pair of ox and be able to work in the woods with them and and get stuff done. It just is not an it's not an efficient use of my time at this point in my life. Uh, and Josh, to add to that, maybe a resource to answer his question would be uh, Rural Heritage. Um, it's a program mm-hmm. on RFD television, and they publish a magazine and put out a calendar and it's he covers a a broad variety of topics um but most all of it is is draft animal driven uh, is mules and donkeys heavy draft horses if anybody is going to have anything to say about working oxen or know who would it would be joe mishka at rural heritage Wow. Good thinking. Will. that's right i haven't i haven't looked that in a long time but that's a great resource and uh, we'll see if we can get a link uh, down below for you guys uh, to get you over to that real quick, but but don't go yet because we're going to finish the show here and we're going to dive into talking about about tools and uh, tools are an important part part an important part <laughs> of every homestead and there's nothing worse and honestly more expensive than a tool that breaks on you regularly. And this is one of the things I love about what Will does. He's making some fantastic tools for us out here working uh, on the homestead or in your garden, wherever you're at, that uh, are just going to hold up for you so well, in fact, that uh, I think if you take care of them, you're going to be passing them on. And uh, that is a really important value. So um, I want to dive in a little bit. And Will, before we talk about just your tools, tell us a little bit just about your background and um, how, how you know, you got into blacksmithing and making these tools and starting Homestead Iron. You bet. Um, I, I came into blacksmithing, honestly, uh, I was, uh, I'm fourth generation Smith. Um, so I started, I started working with it uh, early on with my dad and my grandfather as a as a hobby it was never a profession for my dad he was a machinist and a welder but the uh the blacksmithing shop was always a part of it and i had access to that and learned a bit about it the basics when i was young uh and then took off in life and did a little bit of everything else uh heavy equipment operator a cowboy for a living um it kind of ended my professional career if you will as a as an aircraft maintenance guy um i was a mechanic and then uh, uh director of maintenance and maintenance supervisor for many years for a small airline the the blacksmithing for a living came about the with the the desire to get out of the city um i loved my profession work in aviation maintenance um but i also knew i was going to be a reasonable commute of a major metropolitan airport for the rest of my life um and mm. it just wasn't where i wanted to be i wanted to be farther from town have a little more security and space around me, uh, be able to, you know, it's like the rest of us. I wanted a bigger garden. I wanted to be able to be a little more self-sufficient, hard to do that in the suburbs. Um, mm-hmm. So I came full circle back around to blacksmithing, picked it up as a profession. Um, now what I really in, initially wanted to do was, was break into the, the artisan blacksmith market. I'd like to be doing, or at a, there was a time I would have liked to have been doing cathedral gates and architectural detail and things like that. Um, But tools snuck up on me and kind of took over. Um, I was like everybody else. You uh, mentioned it earlier, these these designed obsolescent tools that you buy them, um, they break, they fall apart. And then you, you begin to realize they just don't perform well either. Even if they stay together, their performance is terrible. Um, either they're uncomfortable to hold or they're not long enough or, or there's many reasons, but I started making my own. Not at that time. 
time. I was making a few knives. I still make a few knives, but I had access to some really great high carbon steel. And really that, that's, that was kind of the catalyst there is, is once I started making a couple of my own tools out of really good high carbon steel, um, that, that kind of changed everything. And I realized, you know, we don't have to put up with this junk that, Mm -hmm. that is available out there. And I made some tools for myself. And then the next thing you know, the neighbor uh, is like, hey, wow, where'd you get those? And some for them. And it kind of, it started organically. And, and as we, as I progressed, uh, just kept getting more and more interest in the tools. And now uh, that's that's just what we do. We make garden tools and I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. Uh, it was a, a niche thing that wasn't being fulfilled. And I'm, I'm happy to find myself there. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're the guy to fulfill it, and and uh, that is a great story. And I, I'm gonna take a detour just for a minute because you you know you relate a story that a lot of people are experiencing right now, and that transition from out in in the regular world. You know, you you were doing mechanics, and a lot of people are mm -hmm. doing things, and they're trying to figure out how to get you know to the homestead and a little closer to the land. And and a lot of people think you need to go farm and make a living farming in order to do that. You've got to raise chickens or you got to do a market garden. And I think you're a great example, your story of there are a lot of different things you can do. It doesn't, you know, to get out to the land and be working close to the land, it doesn't all have to be, you know, directly farm related, producing food or raising animals. And um, you got to find what your skill set is and what your niche is. And you took your both your history and your family and your skill set and you were able to bring that home and create a life for yourself. And I think that's really encouraging to a lot of people and, you know, to to be able to do that and figure out that that pathway with um, your interests and your background. You didn't just have to go and, and start doing, you know, pastured chickens or a market garden or something. You found a way that works real well for you. And, and that's really neat because a lot of people are trying to figure that out. I, I've kind of done it both ways early on. Um, I was still working as a maintenance professional in the aviation industry. Um while I was living in a 20 foot teepee, building a cabin, trying to grow a garden in the rainforest out in Oregon. Um, I've, I've woke up in a teepee and showered off under a can real quick and threw on a suit and tie and caught a plane to a maintenance meeting halfway across the country. Um, whereas now I feel a lot more self-sufficient in that, uh, I'm not able to grow as big a garden as I used to then. Uh, but I don't have to go anywhere. I make, make my living right here on this piece of property and we're, we're oh, depending man. on the internet and, and all our other technology here to be able to do it um but i'm home man and that's a blessing isn't it very very cool yes well cool let's uh let's talk about these tools a little bit um you know i've been using your tools for a couple of years now and uh i don't i just i couldn't say enough good things about them i love them they hold up well they work well um, your long handle tools have a proper long handle, you know, I'm not bending over, breaking my back and, and getting sore. Um, so just tell me a little bit about what sets your tools apart from, from the rest. What, what are you doing to, to, you know, put that value into these to make these things where they're working so well? One of the things I'd mentioned definitely is a little bit of forethought. Uh, first off, I care. Um, and I, I've gone through multiple iterations of each tool, trying to tweak it and modify it and get the angles just right and, and uh, make it as light as it can be and still be as strong as it can be. But one of the, uh, probably one of the biggest things that sets me apart is this, the actual steel I use. And okay. that's not something you can look at and see. Mm -hmm. Good quality, high carbon steel looks exactly like 1018 structure steel. Most of the tools you find in the big box store today, Josh, there's nothing wrong with that metal if it was a car fender or a toaster, but it's not tool okay. steel. Um, All right. There's a, an enormous difference. Somebody somebody will, I'm not going to, I'll paraphrase this because I know it's not direct quote. Somebody will call me out on it, but we're, we're pretty close on, on these numbers. The 1075 spring steel that I use for my tools, the, er, well, we'll say 1018 mild steel. Tensile strength on that is about 75,000 PSI. The 1075 that I use is 285,000 PSI. So it's an, it's an enormous difference. 
and sitting side by side, they look identical. You can't tell them apart. So translate for us, because a lot of people aren't going to know the numbers, PSI, pounds per square inch, and, and obviously one's tougher than the yeah. other. But but what does that look like using that tool? What's the difference between those, those, those metals? Ductility um, and edge retention, just overall hardness. The higher carbon content in the higher grade, high carbon steel allows for a harder steel. It's going to be stronger and tougher overall. It's going to have much it's superior edge retention. If you've got a sharp edge on there, uh, that high carbon steel is what you need to hold that. A lot of these tools you find on the shelf now, they their performance is poor because they do not have an edge ground on them. They're just a blunt squared off edge. And even if you ground an edge, you wouldn't be able to maintain it because they're soft, mild steel. It's structure steel. Like I said, it's it's for making car fenders and toasters. It's not designed chemically for good edge retis- retention and abrasion resistance. Yeah. Okay. So there it's, it's a lot harder. It's going to stay a lot sharper. And I think, you know, one of the things I've experienced a lot is just broken, broken handles, especially with some of the smaller tools, you know. They just break and they bend yeah. easier. So that that's part of that hardness of that steel too, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Handle attachment is a big issue, but yeah, a lot of them, uh, it, it comes down to mostly that material selection first. And yeah. then good workmanship is next and, and just good practice, good, good procedure using quality yeah. material. So tell us a little bit about, you know, you're using, you're using wo- all wood handles, which I love. Um, there's just nothing like the feel of wood in your hand and they seem to hold up better to me. I don't know that I can really make that argument from some of the modern stuff, but you might be able to speak into that a little bit, but I I love the wood handles. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. And the thing I could say right off the bat, hopefully this will show, this is one of my primary forging hammers. I use this hammer every day. Um, it's in my hand constantly and I love that wood handle, there's no, there's nothing feels better on your hand. Your hands are really an amazing thing, the way they're designed to grip and hold all the creases of your hands fold together and, and, and create these little pockets that grip. It's one of the big things I talk to people initially in a blacksmithing class. You should never have a glove on your hammer hand. Your hand is made to grip that smooth wood. If you have a glove on that's in between you and the hammer, uh, for one, you're deadening your sense of feel that the the, mm-hmm. the handle is, is providing you feedback that you're losing and you're having to grip tighter than you have than you should have to. That leather or whatever that glove is will not grip the way that microscopic ridges and pores on your palm will grip. And so pretty soon you're going to kill your forearm trying to hold on to that thing with a glove on and the same thing goes josh when we get into i know you've seen hammer handles that look like this um Mm -hmm. they have this plastic uh you know a plastic or fiberglass handle and it's got these soft cushy ridges in there and when you're in the store and you grab it and you feel it in your hand you think man i can really grip that thing um Mm -hmm. this should be perfect and the reality of it is is all that that difference in texture between the the harder plastic and the softer plastic um that creates a little pinch point on your hand um you're gonna you'll chew your hands up in no time i I, i've got a pretty good amount of callus on my hands from hammering and it's specific to hammering i know that because if i switch to another task where i'm putting pressure on it a different point of my hand i can still raise a blister on my hand even even right next to you know a callus that i have to take a spice grater to to grate it down and keep it under control i'll i'll, I'll blister right next to it when i do something else but anyway my point was don't fall for gimmicks and widgets you can't yeah. beat a good smooth well manufactured wood handle um these textured plastic ones they look good but Mm, they're gonna they're gonna tear up your hands over time 
Yeah, they just they just don't hold up. And I, I'd never really thought about that, but I rate relate intuitively to what you're saying about that wood in your hand and and not having a glove. I often don't wear gloves just because of what you said. And I don't know that I've even thought it through a whole lot, but it just never felt right. Never a lot of tools don't feel right in my hand if I've got gloves on and and um, they don't feel right in those plastic handles or metal handles. Um, the wood just seems to fit to your hand and, and grip well, and it's a lot nicer tool to work with. And so you're putting all this together, this wood and iron, to just make a tool that lasts, that holds up well, it does the job well, and it's it's comfortable to use, I think. Well, you reach, you reach back and, th and think back to uh, folks who used these tools that, that we're rediscovering now today for a living. The, the classics were classics for a reason. Grandma and grandpa didn't have plastic widgety kind of handles. They just had tools that worked and we don't need to go reinventing the wheel on a hoe. Our great grandparents had that one right years ago. Just wood and steel is in good workmanship is hard to beat. We don't need yeah. a marketing gimmick to, to resell us on something new. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, so tell us a little bit about tool maintenance because, you know, a lot of these tools we're talking about are made to throw away these plastic. They're really so much of our stuff today is throwaway stuff and you can't sharpen it. Or if you can, it's not going to hold an edge or, you know, if it's plastic and you leave it out, it's eventually going to crack and break and fall apart on you. And they're, they're really throwaway products where what you're making is a product that's made to last and it's got the materials in it. It's got the thought about it for usability for holding up, but uh, you, you do need to take care of them. You're not, plastic's just plastic. You're just going to put it away or do whatever right. you do with it. These tools need a little bit of attention to work right for you over the years, but then they're going to work right for you decade after decade, not just for a year or two. So tell us a little bit about your tools, um, what needs to be maintained both in the metal and in the wood and, and just uh, tool care in general. Sure. Uh, the number one thing with them, if you did absolutely nothing else, ever just put them up out of the rain and direct sunlight when you're done even yeah. if you didn't rinse them off if you did absolutely nothing else just don't leave them laying in the wet grass when you're done and they you'll triple their lifespan just with that next next tier of care having them in a little garden shed you know a good place to hang them where you can keep them organized I love having uh, shadow box type of stuff so you can tell at a glance if something's missing. The the biggest the thing that's going to go first on on any of any of them will be the wood handle. So a little bit of linseed oil or tongue oil, you know, just a good wood oil on that handle a couple of times a year. Um, if you get any rough st spots, a little bit of sandpaper, you know, dust mm -hmm. dust them off with some sandpaper. Maybe a couple times of the year in the fall before you you put them up. Give them a light coat of uh, light sand and then a good liberal coat of linseed oil on them and spend some time. Rub that linseed oil in with your hands. Spend some time working it. Uh, and in fact, rub on it until your, your palm starts to warm up and it'll warm the, the fibers in the wood, the pores in the wood. And it'll warm the oil and it'll penetrate better. Uh, if you just put a big heavy coat of linseed oil on there and lay it down, uh, it'll kind of dry out and make your handle tacky. But spend a little time and rub that oil in real good. A couple times a year, and that'll that'll uh, uh, nutrition isn't the right word for it, but your wood needs a little bit of moisture uh, and hydration. It needs that oil replaced. And then uh, another trick that I really liked uh, that was sent to me by a, one of our customers was she used a bucket of sand by her shed to to clean her tools off. When she was done, she would just dunk them in that sand, and it it uh, cleaned her tools off before she hung them up. So. Yeah, uh, you know, store your tools somewhere where they're not sitting in the direct sunlight uh, and they're not getting rained and soaked in water. They, My tools are all carbon steel and they will rust, which most of the mm -hmm. time is just superficial in nature. The best way, if they do rust, the best way to clean them up is just use them. Uh, most of them will shine right back up with a little bit of use. Um, but yeah, store, store them inside, keep some linseed oil or good quality wood oil on that handle a couple times a year, keep them clean, keep them dry. And then occasionally, depending on your usage, we're down in the Ozarks. We got lots of rocks. We make sparks when we garden. Um, so our <laughs> blades need to be sharpened more often than somebody that's got soft, loamy, sandy soil. 
sure. Um, yeah. I, I get asked often of how often do I need to sharpen my tool? And I have no way mm-hmm. to answer that because it depends on how you're using it and what your soil's like. But when you do need to sharpen your tool, uh, I suggest a file. Um, you can get your tool in a file. I draw the temper on my tools just enough that uh, a good, sharp, crisp new file will cut them. If you've got an old file that's starting to get a little bit slick, you won't make a dent in them because they are pretty hard. You have to have a good, crisp file to cut them um, yeah. and get them in a vise where they're not going to vibrate and all that. I also, everybody asks me, can I grind on them? You can, but here's the problem with grinding. You have to be very judicious and be very careful. Just like a knife, uh, my tools are high carbon steel, and it's the same if you got a good axe or any any kind of cutting tool. It's going to be high carbon steel. It's going to be hardened and tempered, which is all a function of heat control. You can get on a grinder and grind that edge. And if you ever, uh, I'm sure, Josh, you've seen this running a grinder, you start to see color show up in that bright metal you're grinding, those oxide colors of, of yeah, yeah. kind of straw and purple. There's a little rainbow. Once you start to see those colors, you have lost your temper. Uh, and yeah. that's what that means. That's where the phrase comes from. You've uh, you've effectively softened your metal um, from getting it too hot. So you can grind on them, but do just a little bit at a time, dunk it in some water a little bit at a time, and you are running that risk all the time of getting it too hot and losing your temper on your tool and softening it. Yeah, and you know, with with grinding, I found that uh, it can be hard to keep your edge consistent and the bevel consistent. There's there's a lot of things you can do to a tool, especially to a knife that's a little more honed in, but even some of these tools that uh, um, I get it done, I can get it done on the homestead, but you gotta be careful because you can, if you're not being careful there, you can just kind of start to reshape the tool as well in a way that you don't really want to. So um, sounds to me like most right. of the time your tools, they're hard enough if you just keep an edge on them with that file and um, you know, don't try to hammer rocks with them too much. I mean, sometimes you can't help it if you got a lot of rocks in your garden, but you know, use them for the right purpose and you shouldn't have to be grinding on them too much. Let's see here. Um, you know, I, I meant I wanted to ask you while you were talking about using that oil. So one of the things I do just to save a few bucks, we've always got a lot of lard or tallow. And so I use uh-huh. one of those often on my handles just because I have a lot of it. And I've usually got a little tongue oil or lean, linseed oil around as well. But um, that's a lot more expensive. Uh, and in my experience, it's held up pretty good. Is there is that is that a you know viable option for people? Um, as far as you're concerned or anything wrong with that? I do not see why that would be a problem, um, especially given that's something I'm assuming you're producing extremely locally. Um, linseed oil is, is $27 yeah. a gallon now. Um, that is, yeah. it is a substantial cost enough so that, you know, I'm starting to, I treat all my tools in linseed oil. I don't like to spray uh, like a chemical coating on them. I can put linseed oil yeah. on them. It keeps the rust off on the shelf. But at the end of the day, at, at $27, $30 a gallon for linseed oil now, it's 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 getting pretty steep. Uh, and, yeah. if, uh, you know, for for someone who's just treating their, their fleet of garden tools and hand tools a couple of times a year, well, then you're only down to maybe a quart of linseed oil. So you're probably paying an even higher premium buying in that smaller quantity for it. Yeah, yeah, I would think yeah, your your lard or, or your locally produced oil, anything you got is going to be better than nothing. Yeah, well, good. That's good to know because that's how I approach it. I mean, we we you know harvest animals every year, and Carolyn always renders the lard and and the tallow, and so I tend to use tallow a little bit more just because we don't care for consuming the tallow as much, the flavor of it and the consistency of it. Um, but you know, I'll use either depending on what we have on hand. And, and I, I actually did a video not too long ago. We'll link to it. You guys that demonstrates exactly what you were talking about, Will, and just sanding that handle down and and rubbing the oil in. And I didn't rub it in quite as much as you're talking about. And, um, but, but, uh, that's a real easy process to do. And it's actually really enjoyable to enjoy the grain and the natural features of the wood when you're doing that to me, it's a very relaxing, nice chore, uh, to do when I get to, to condition those handles. I always enjoy putting the oil on the handles that last step um, because my handles always look kind of pale and white and blank and plain. And as soon as you rub that oil in, 
uh, all the different colors of the wood and the different grain, uh, all the figure, and you see all the detail of the wood just pops right out. It really comes to life with a coat of that oil. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, and you know, you do those things and these tools are going to last you forever. And, and, you know, one of the things I want to get to before uh, we wrap up and we're getting close to that is, you know, your your tools do come with a price. They're they're not going to be as, as cheap as some other tools. And, you know, there's a couple different sayings out there. Um, you know, one is quality is not expensive. It's priceless. Um, another one, price wow. is what you pay. Value is what you get. And so... Um, just tell us a little bit because about about that value to the price of your tools. I, I personally believe it's why it's worth it. I, I've told our audience, you know, why I think your tools are worth it. But I'd like to hear it from you because it's just it's there. It's it's a it's a good it's in fact. It's a great price, which you're selling for the value of what you get. And that's important for uh, people to know and understand. Yeah. And I think that's twofold, Josh, in that. uh you're getting your value in, in two ways. You're going to get a tool that lasts much longer. Um, so let's say, for example, you pay $15 uh, for a lesser tool that breaks in a year and you replace it every year. Uh, and you're a gardener for 10 years. You're at 150 bucks for this one tool where you could have bought an, one from us that I guarantee for life um, for $40. It is substantially more. But mm -hmm. over, you amortize that price over time, um, and and you're looking pretty you're looking pretty good. Then the 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 price per usage goes down considerably. The next thing you have to to try to quantify there is for the one year that that fifteen dollar or that lesser tool did stay together for you, it didn't work very well. It took you yeah. twice as long to do the same job that a well-designed tool something maybe with a little more heft a little more weight that will swing and pendulum it's nice and sharp it'll cut you can do the same amount of work in half the time so there's the other half of that coin um, you're going to get a tool that lasts longer and not only that it's going to outperform that other one hands down um, probably one of my favorite examples for that is my Grand Four Burks Axe, I'm always keen to plug them. I think they're one of the greatest success stories of businesses out there. They're a forge that's been around forever. I love their story and I love their product. I paid uh, 130 to 150, I forget exactly what I paid for my little Grand Four Burks Axe. I would pay double that instantly in a heartbeat if I had to. I, I don't remember what I paid, It's it, it doesn't matter. That was 30 some years ago. And that ax is still like brand new. Not only performs flawlessly every time I pick it up, it's got a soul. It was made by a human being with a ton of skill. And every time I touch it, I admire and appreciate uh, KS. I don't know who that, that is, but some yeah. guy in Sweden with the initials KS yeah. did a fine job on that ax. And I've admired his work for the last 30 years. Well, that and that's just it. It's uh, in in the long run, you're actually saving money. And and as homesteaders, as people that are getting back to the land, I think that's a that's a thinking that we need to make sure and embrace because we're thinking the long term. We're not just thinking right now. We're putting a lot of effort into our life, a lot of times into our families, to what we're doing for not just short term gain, but for long term gain. And so we've got to realize sometimes that the value is over time. But in the end something like what you're making is actually a lot less expensive and a lot higher value. And so, you know, with that, I got We got to wrap up here. But uh, Will, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and get more familiar with your tools in Homestead Iron? You can find us online at homesteadiron.com. That is our website. That's our primary uh, sales portal, our store. Um, and Jamie's there at herbs and iron at gmail.com. That's our email. She's happy to answer all your questions. And that that's our that's our primary contact is our, our homesteadiron.com store. Yeah. And our email is herbs and iron at gmail.com. Very cool, Will. Well, you guys, I will leave links. We'll leave links down there in the post for you guys so you can go check them out. It's a good time to be getting set up for spring. 
And uh, Will, thanks for hanging out with me today here in the Preservation Kitchen. And um, just hope you guys have a fantastic spring. The gardens grow well. And, and um, it's just been great hanging with you guys. You too, Josh. We appreciate you coming to talk to us. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you guys get your garden started up there. I always, I always feel a little, uh, uh, we're, we're down here enjoying warm weather and new leaves. And I know you're in the snow up there. Yeah, yeah, we haven't even got the peas in yet. Hopefully this next weekend, uh, it has been a longer, cooler in spring than even normal for here in North Idaho. So, um, but we're, we're about to get to it. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Josh. We really appreciate you guys. You as well.